Okay, so let's go back to uh, Leviticus chapter 23. Okay, Leviticus chapter 23. So, the tenth day, verse 27, the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the <coughs> Lord, and ye shall do no work in that, self, in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. And whatsoever soul it shall be, shall not be afflicted in that same day. He shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in the same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even to even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Okay, so this was obviously a special Sabbath, Sabbath day. They weren't to do any work, they were to um, celebrate a day of atonement. And, uh, but of course, there were some things that, that were involved in doing that. Firstly, they were to afflict their souls, and they did that in a variety of ways. Uh, we see today that they do things differently than what uh, the Bible does. And, and uh, mostly the, the affliction of the soul was to uh, fast and, and, and do things like that. An offering was to be made by fire, and fire speaks of judgment. So as we go through, I want to be, I want to get to the end of this <coughs> feast of atonement. The problem is, I've been adding more slides to it as I keep reviewing and revising, and finding more stuff to add to it. Um, but I'm going to try and aim to finish this. Okay, so let's start. Just revise a little bit where we finished off last week. Okay, so last week. Uh, we, there were to be an offering made on the Day of Atonement. This offering was to be made by fire. And then we looked at the, the type of burnt offering dependent on your class of people. So depending if you're upper class, middle class, or lower class. And most of us would call ourselves upper class, wouldn't we? I mean, we would be if we were lived in India. <laughs> Well, in New Zealand, we would probably call ourselves lower class, or well, maybe middle class. <laughs> but there are different sacrifices that were to be offered according to your pay scale. Okay, it was according to your pay scale. So a ritual well-to-do would offer from the herd. So it would be a bullock or something along that line, something which was expensive. You know, most of the poor people might have had one cow to get milk from. They might have, but more likely they would have had goats and things where they got their milk from. But a cow was an expensive thing. Okay, it was expensive. Think of um, um, Jack and the Beanstalk. He had to go and sell his cow, but of course he exchanged it for some beans, which he planted, and then there was the, the Beanstalk that went up to heaven to goose that get, laid the golden egg and all that sort of thing. But the, there was just one cow and he had to sell that cow. And if you had to bring that cow or a bullock or something which you used out in the field and you offered it, well, who was going to do the work if you only had one? So dependent on your pay scale. So a rich or well-to-do person would offer from the herd. A middle-income person possibly like you and me, would offer from the flock. So either a goat or a sheep, something like that. Something that was a lot cheaper, more in abundance. Okay. Uh, low income would then offer a chicken, a dove or a pigeon. Might have to catch it first. And, um, but anyway, um, they are the, the ones that, that were sold and the money changes hands and, 
and things like that. So the poor people would then bring their money and they would exchange that money for whatever they could sacrifice. So depending on your pay scale is dependent on what you offered. Okay? So obviously, um, if we're talking about um, tithes and offerings, it's 10%. But of course, a rich person who earns a lot of money would, their 10% is a lot more than a poor person. Okay? If you're on the dole or a sickness benefit or something like that, that would be 10% be a lot lower. The offerings were made for four classes of people. So not only were there three types of offerings, depending on your pay scale, so if you're rich, middle income, or low income, right? there were also the offerings for four classes of people. The first class of people could was obviously the anointed priest. He would have to sacrifice or first, because he was the one that was going to go into the Holy of Holies. He was the one that's going to stand before God. So he had to sacrifice first for the, before he could offer for the sin of the people. So he was the first one to make that offering. So the anointed priest, whoever that was at that time, um, remember the, the high priest started with Aaron and then went along his line, okay, the, that priestly line. He would need to offer for himself before he could offer for the people. Secondly, for the whole congregation. And we sort of read that in, in um, Second Chronicles under Hezekiah's rule. There's the sacrifice for the whole congregation. Then we have the ruler, whoever the ruler was at that time. Uh, king, might have been King David, King Hezekiah, whoever that was in rule. So we start off with the priest. Start up with a congregation, and then we go to the ruler, and then, of course, it's for the individual. Okay, for the individual. The priest was the intercessor between man and God, so he had to be fixed up first. Then there's the congregation, the group of people. That's what we read about in Second Chronicles. And then it was the ruler, and then, of course, the individual. Now, only clean animals were to be offered, for obvious reasons. Clean animals were to be offered for, you know, God wants a perfect sacrifice. So it wasn't to go to the flock and say, well, here's one which is lame or blind or is fly-blown or, you know, things like that. We'll take that one because we don't need it. Or there's a, a bullock who is weak and and can't, um, you know, it's not, not very good for the, um, what do you call those things you put over their necks? Yoke. Yoke, thank you. Yay. Um, I worry about myself sometimes. I get lost for words. So a yoke, and, and so let's offer that, you know, because that's not very good anymore. No, it had to be clean animals, clean in terms of the cleanliness rather than uh, dirty animals in, in terms of pigs and things, but also it had to be uh, perfect in, in, in that sense as well. So clean, that it lived, um, that lived by the death of others or fed on the dead, of, dead flesh of others, like a vulture, was unclean to be offered. Okay, It had to be clean, a clean animal. And um, so how many clean animals went into the ark? They went in by sevens. Okay, People always think they go in two by twos. But no, clean animals went in by sevens. And um, of course I didn't count how many when I asked that question. I thought, maybe they want a th count of how many clean animals there are. No, they went in by sevens rather than two by twos. Two by two were the unclean animal. So the animal offered was to be without blemish, was to be slain at the door of the tabernacle uh, before the Lord. The priest was to bring a young bullock and lay his hand on the head and then kill it. So the passing of the sin of the people, the passing the sin of himself and his family, onto the animal and then kill it. The same way as Christ, upon himself, he took our guilt and our burden. Okay. Um, the congregation also brought a young bullock and the elders of the congregation laid their hands on it and it was killed. The ruler brought a male kid and laid his hand upon the head and killed it. So let's go to Leviticus. 
So we 24, so go to 4, chapter 4. Keep your bookmark and 23. The ruler brought a male kid. Remember <coughs> that they brought also other ones. Brought hundreds of animals were brought often. But he had to bring a male kid. Verse 22 through to 24. When ruler hath sinned, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, so a ruler is not exempt. When a ruler hath sinned, and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord as God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin, wherein he hath sinned, come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. Obviously, the wages of sin is death. Or here we have the innocent animal paying the penalty for the ruler's sin. Christ paid the penalty for your sin and for mine. We were guilty, and yet Christ, who was innocent, paid that price. But notice there two things. Firstly, it was a goat. And the goat was to be male, again without blemish. And he shall lay his hand upon the goat. So the transferring of the guilt onto the goat and then the killing of the male uh, goat, the kid. Okay. And the common people brought a female kid. Laid his hand, the priest would lay his hands on it and then kill it. And you notice it's a male and a female. Why a female kid and not a male? Okay, we'll look at that. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 8. Psalms, Proverbs. Chapter 8, 15 and 16. Okay, so, by me kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles, even the judges of the earth. So, we're trying to make the connection between why male kid and the, and the king. So, we know the, the task of the king was to rule. He was the one that was in charge. Okay? He was the one in charge. The king is the one in charge. Go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. So turn to the left a little ways. Chapter 23. <coughs> verse 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Okay, so again, a king or a ruler rules in the fear of God, keeping God's commandments, etc., etc. Okay, so a ruler, a person who is in charge, is a person who would have to bring a male goat. They go to First Timothy. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter two. And verses one and two. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayer, intercessions, and all and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. 
So kings, for kings, for those that are in authority. Okay. So, in this case, the prescribed sacrifice was a goat and a he goat in particular, a male goat. So when you go to Leviticus chapter 4, you'll see that the, if a king had sinned ignorantly in ignorance, or he came to the knowledge that he had sinned, he had offer a male goat. Sacrifice was a goat. The offering of the private person was to be a female which was proper to one having no authority. So who's the ruler of the house? Is it the male or the female? The male. Mm -hmm. Who's the ruler of a country? In Israel, for example. The king. The one that's in authority had to bring a male sacrifice. And the others would um, then give a female sacrifice. And the ruler had to bring a male. So let's go back to Leviticus chapter 4. That's where we were a moment ago. I didn't put a bookmark there. Leviticus chapter 4. Verse 27. So verses 22, uh, we've seen that the ruler hath sinned. Verse 27, and if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he hath sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female, without blemish, for his sin which he hath sinned. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering, and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. So, not only were there different classes of sacrifices that they were to bring, there were also the different sacrifices for the different people groups. Okay, so for the priest, for the congregation, for the ruler, and <coughs> excuse me, and for the common people, and for the, the king who had sinned, it was a he goat. For the common people, it was a she goat. Alright? So let's turn back to First Timothy. Sorry to do this to you. Should have told you to put a bookmark there. First Timothy chapter two. Click on. Verses eleven through to fourteen. says, let women keep silence in the church. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So you can see also in the sacrifices that they were to bring, there was a difference. Male and female. And uh, also here, for at in verse 13, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. In other words, Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he took a bite of that fruit. It was Eve that was deceived. And Adam decided to go with Eve. As men always do. Because the woman's always right. Verse 15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So, you see, you take that verse out of context, 
and you end up saying that a woman who has a child is saved. Isn't that what it says? Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. So a woman who doesn't have children is not saved and can never be saved. Because she's, you know, only, you, women are only saved in childbearing. Of course, we've taken that out of context. We don't want to do that. <clears throat> okay. The difference in offerings is seen in the treatment of the blood as well. So there's not only is there different types of animals, but also what happens with the blood of that animal. Okay? And how the body is disposed of. The blood of the offering of the priest and the congregation was taken by the priest into the holy place of the tabernacle. So the sacrifice was usually done outside. Outside. And then the blood was taken into the holy place. And on the day of Yom Kippur, it was taken into the holy of holies. And that was only once a year. So the offering for the priest, if I just flip back, back the, the blood of the offering for the priest and the congregation was taken in by the priest into the holy place of the tabernacle. Okay, So it was killed out, outside and then taken inside. Okay, So the priest would dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the veil and put some of it on the horns of the altar of incense. So there's the altar of incense. Put some on the... I don't know if you can see the little touch of blood on that horn there. And he would pour out the remainder at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering. That is for the priest. The blood of the offering of the ruler and the congregation was not taken into the tabernacle, but put on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. So on these horns here, this is the burnt offering here, and the blood was put on that, and the rest poured out at the bottom of the altar. You can see all that blood. There would be lots of blood flowing around. The bodies were disposed of differently as well. Uh, the offering for the priest and congregation, uh, the offering was skinned, and the fat kidneys and rump were burnt, and the skin, head, and legs were carried outside the camp to a clean place, and the ashes were poured out. For the ruler and the common people, the fat burnt, and the body not taken out the camp, but given to the priest for food. Okay, so the for the... Um, Priest, it was taken out, burnt, all those sort of things were burnt, but was for the common people, for the ruler and the common people, the Levites, because they didn't have any land, they needed to survive, and so that was given to them. That was their food given to them for food. Leviticus 16. Verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> okay, verse 2. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark that he die not for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering so again we see the different types of animals that were brought and the different types of sacrifice that were, were given so God said I will appear in the cloud um, with a, uh, where are we, in verse 2. That he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil, before the mercy seat which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So the mercy seat was in the holy of holies, and God was there in the form of a cloud. God's earthly glory resided 
in, as a cloud and upon the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And of course, you need to be careful that you entered in the right time. It was only once a year and come before the Lord to, to bring and without. You could not enter without blood. It had to have, he had to have blood. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest was to bring a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Verses 4 through to 6. He shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goat, goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. So the high priest then was to properly bathe himself. It's all this religious rigmarole that he had to go through. Praise the Lord, Christ did all that. We don't have to do all this. And clothe himself in the official garments of the high priest as prescribed for the high priest. Now, remember that God had prescribed these things. They didn't just decide to do it. This was God-ordained clothing. Okay? The priest was also to bring two kids and goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. These were to be on behalf of the congregation of Israel. Aaron was, the fir was first to take the bullock and offer it as a sin offering for his own sin and thus make atonement for himself and his family. So he had to get himself ready first before he could intercede on behalf of others. Okay? Go to Hebrews. Hebrews 7. Nineteen through to twenty-eight. Hebrews 7, beginning at verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect. The law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did, by which, by the which we draw nigh unto God. So they, were, they did it because they were looking for something that was better. Even though they could never ever make themselves perfect, there was, there was a hope there. And that hope lay in Christ. Verse 20. And as much as not with an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So that, that part there, verse 21, is in brackets. So it's talking about a specific character, which of course is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were made priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not delay as those, high, uh, sorry, delay, daily, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins 
and then for the peoples, peoples, for this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law maketh the son, who is consecrated forevermore. So in other words, there always had to be a changing priesthood because they died. They died. So throughout the Old Testament dispensation, sin was covered by the shed blood of the various sacrificed animals. It's only the blood of Christ which would later wash that sin away. Let's go back to Leviticus. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat <coughs> into uh, the wilderness. Okay, so the high priest was to take two goats for the congregation, bringing them to the door of the tabernacle, presenting them before the Lord, and then a lot was cast. So which one was going to die? And which is going to be the scapegoat? Or the lucky goat that's going to escape? Get it? No. Okay. Uh, lots were cast over the two goats, selecting one for the Lord and the other as a scapegoat. The one which was the Lord's was then offered as a sin offering on behalf of the congregation of Israel. The other goat would be let go into wilderness as a scapegoat, symbolically bearing the sins of the nation. Okay, the sins of the nation. The high priest was to fill the golden censer with live coals from the brazen altar. So if you go, drop down to verse 12. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from, the, from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat to uh, eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. So there's lots of blood flowing. Okay, and sprinkling of blood. So you see the priest was to fill the golden censer with live coals from the brazen altar. And the brazen altar is outside in the courtyard, uh, just outside the holy place. And uh, of the tabernacle, he was to take the prescribed sweet incense with his other hand. Then and only then was he allowed to enter into the holy of holies, the holy place within the veil. Upon entering the holy place, the holy incense was then placed upon the live coals. As the incense in the censer came into contact, remember they were live coals, pour the incense on the coals, and all of a sudden steam, or steam, the, the incense would rise, the smoke would rise, and which would cover the Lord. Because no one's seen God and lived, right? And God lived between the two cherubims. And so the priest came in, Two, two things, a live coal and the incense poured one on the other. Steam would rise, which co would cover uh, the, the Lord. And as the incense and the censer came into contact with the live coals, a cloud of smoke arose. And notice that in verse 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he <coughs> die not. Because no one's seen God and lived. So that was a 
covering of God, if you like, to save the priest. The high priest was then instructed to take a censer before the Lord, such that the cloud of the incense smoke would cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. We've just seen that. The incense, no doubt, was a sweet aroma to God. Sweet-smelling savour obviously comes through in the Old Testament in the sacrifices. As it rose as a cloud before the mercy seat, it likely hid the Shekinah glory of God. In all likelihood, the high priest did not actually see the presence of God. Because no one seen God and lived. Um, the high priest was to take the blood of the bullock and he, that he had just slain for his own sins and sprinkle it with the finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood of it with his finger seven times. And we see that in verse 14. He shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Times. One, two, I hope he doesn't lose count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the sins of the high priest and family were atoned or covered before he could deal with the sin of the nation. He first had to deal with his own sin before a holy God. I have to turn the page to verses 15 through 19. So we're talking about the, the day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. On the tenth day of the seventh month, verse 15, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do, that, and do with the blood, with that blood, as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before uh, the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of the uncleanness. Down verse 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place, until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and to make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Okay, so the sacrifice. So kill the goat, the sin offering that is for the people and bring his own blood within the veil and do that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the, mer and before the mercy seat. After having sprinkled the blood of the bullock for himself, the high priest then he, uh, excited the holy uh, place out into the courtyard of the tabernacle. <laughs> so, exited. Excited. He was very excited. Exited of the tabernacle and killed the sin offering. <coughs> goat for the people. He returned back into the holy place with his blood sprinkling it both before and upon the mercy seat. Okay, the collective sin of the entire nation of Israel was atoned, covered, as the blood of the sin offering was sprinkled on the Day of Atonement annually. Okay, we've already seen uh, Hebrews 7. Let's go to Hebrews 9. Remember that the tabernacle and the temple was a picture of a heavenly one, Very dry, isn't it? That's why I have some water. Verse 7. <clears throat> but into the second, with the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, 
which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The first tabernacle was the tabernacle with the temple, the Old Testament. Okay? So the second couldn't come until the first was um, done away with. In verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So in other words, Christ took his own blood, not into the temple, not into the tabernacle, not into the Holy of Holies on an earthly scene, but a heavenly. He went into the Holy of Holies and presented his blood before God the Father. And if you go down to verse 24, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Christ himself didn't go into the tabernacle or the temple as it was then, Herod's temple, didn't go into the Holy of Holies on earth, but it was the heavenly temple that he went. Remember, the earthly temple is a picture of what is in heaven, the true. It's a bit like the parables that we've been looking at in Sunday school. There are a earthly picture of a heavenly truth. Um, okay, we're getting there, getting closer, closer and closer. So the biblical day of atonement was for the forgiveness of sins for the nation of Israel rather than the individual Israelite. And Zechariah 13, 1 and 2, we see the complete removal of the sins of the nation. And we've already seen all that. Uh, this will bring the Jews as a nation back into fellowship with God because sin hindered them from fellowship being with God. Okay? So, what have we seen so far? Okay. Nearly there. What have we seen there? We've seen the feast of the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits, the feast of Pentecost, the feast of trumpets, the feast of atonement. And we'll see in, a, in the next few weeks the Feast of Tabernacles. So we see in these feasts God's plan for mankind. Okay? God's plan for mankind. So the first two feasts is God's plan. So his first plan is to redeem mankind. So he looks forward to Christ and his atoning work on the cross. The blood that saved them. The wage of sin is death. But the blood covered them. They were cleansed. The angel of death passed over. And the, um, the unleavened bread, speaking of Christ's body, which is sinless. Sinless. Not sinless. Sinless. Okay? We also see that the first fruits looks to the Lord's resurrection. So we see his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Okay? His body that was sacrificed for us. And the Feast of First Fruits was then the resurrection. <coughs> so everything now is prepared. Basically, this is God's plan. He pictured it in the Old Testament through the sacrifices. <coughs> this was a sacrifice that was to come. That was the Lord's sacrifices. God's plan for mankind. Once that is done, he then says, okay... 
they've rejected the Messiah, I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. And so he looks to the salvation of the Gentiles. Well, we also know that the church is being built at that time. And it's not particularly just to the Gentiles, but it's to all mankind. That's the Jews as well, as an individual. Okay? So God then, at the Feast of Pentecost, um, looks to the salvation of mankind as individuals. Then we see the Feast of Trumpets as looks, and the Feast of Atonement looks to the salvation of the Jews. So the Lord's return and the salvation as a nation. And then, of course, the final feast, which we will look at, is then looks to the God's eternal kingdom. God's plan in the feasts. So saving mankind from sin, dealing with the Gentiles, bringing them in, and then dealing with the nation of Israel. And so there's no one is left out. There's no people groups left out. Because if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And if you're not a Gentile, you must be a Jew. So it, it's all uh, encompassing. It takes in every single uh, person. So let's then finish this off. And we'll look at the prodigal son again. At Luke chapter 15. And then we'll be finished. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 15. <clears throat> so, verse, if we pick it up from verse 11, it says, And he said, A certain, a certain man had two sons. So the, here we have the representation of the Jews and the Gentiles. Two sons, and if we drop down to verse 20, and he rose and came to his father. So the first son, he squandered his life, went astray, and um, spent all his father's inheritance. And then the worst thing of all for a Jewish person is to be sweet, feeding the swines. Okay? It makes you lower than the low, lower than the dirty animals. Okay? Pigs were the, the, considered as dirty animals and were not to be eaten. And here, a Jew was feeding them, and he was going hungry, so which elevated him above a pig, uh, below a pig. The pig was elevated above uh, him. And so he goes home. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. So we see then the picture of the nation of Israel in repentance. We looked at it in Zechariah where God opens up uh, the the grace throne of grace to the nation and um, verse 22 and the father said unto his servants bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and, his, and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry here's Mary again Finches a lot, doesn't she? And down to verse 32. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And so the prodigal son returns. The nation of Israel will return. Okay, will return. And we see that happening already in the process. In the process, they're back in the land. Okay? And we live in a time where the UN, United Nations, are generally united against Israel. 
Okay, we've seen the organisation All the Nations has been politically against uh, Jerusalem. And uh, I won't take time to go through this, but the United World Armies under the United Nations will seem to be victorious when they <coughs> conquer the nation of Israel. And you can look that up in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 2. Jerusalem is divided. Half is Arab and half is Israeli. Okay, we have the East Jerusalem, we have West Jerusalem. Half will go into exile. And you can read about that in uh, Zechariah 14, verse 2. And then what I pulled off here a few months ago, on the 31st of July, 2017, UN body demands Israel abandon capital in Jerusalem. The United Nations are demanding that Israel abandon capital in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's always been the capital. And it would seem that Jerusalem is utterly defeated by the United Nations and Antichrist victorious. Um, but, in Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4, in chapter 12 as well, Israel's great day of atonement uh, will be in chapter 14 where God will deal with the nations and redeem the people back to himself. Um, okay, so throughout eternity our Lord will carry the scars and marks uh, of love to all men and the Jews will be like doubting Thomas. And I think that's just about it. Boom. <sighs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity this evening to have a look at the sacrifices that were carried out. Uh, Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, we don't have to worry about sacrifices any longer. Father, we thank you also that uh, the Day of Atonement is coming for the nation of Israel as a people group. And Father, we do pray, Lord, that uh, indeed we may continue to reach out to the lost, whether they are Jews or they are Gentiles. We know, Father, there is a future that lies ahead. And Father, we do pray that uh, they might be saved. The Bible speaks about uh, praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And so, Father, we do pray uh, for the people, for your people. We know, Father, that they are separated from you. They're no different than any unbeliever. Uh, but, Father, one day you will... One day, draw them back to yourself, and Father, that you will redeem them. It will be a day, uh, such a great day, when they will recognize uh, the Savior, the one whom they have crucified, uh, the one who has the marks in his hands and his feet. And Father, we do praise and thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us that, that picture in, in your word. And Father, we do pray, Lord, as we continue to look at this final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. Father, hey, you will rule and reign uh, forever. Father, we often speak of the millennial reign being a thousand years, but your reign will continue on throughout all eternity. We pray, Father, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Turn to hymn number 592.